Okay, so uh, hello everyone. My name is Phil. To those who don't know me yet, I am one of the business relations officer of Chicago Deal Vault. Uh, unfortunately, Hugo is not with us tonight, so he asked me to run the webinar today. And I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar with the topic, short sales, do's and don'ts, be prepared for 2022. So allow me to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, she was a managing real estate broker at Lincoln Park Homes and did uh, 116.5 million in sales. She is currently a broker at uh, Coldwell Banker Gold Coast and is 21 years CAR Professional Standards Arbitration Hearing Chair and NAR Mediator. She is an investor as well as an author of books such as no Fear Investing, How to Avoid Real Estate Pitfalls, How to Avoid uh, Pitfalls, Failures, and Growth, uh, and Grow Your Wealth. So she's here with us tonight and to share about her expertise with short sales. So friends, let's welcome, well, let me welcome to you uh, Betsy, Betsy Green. Hello, Betsy. Hey, Phil. Thanks so much. Thanks for that great intro. So um, I want to say welcome, everybody, to Short Sale Do's and Don'ts today. And um, I'd, I'd like to find out a little bit about you, if possible, too. Um, I don't know if, Phil, you can um, watch the chat box. Do we have a chat box on here? Yes, we do, uh, on the okay. right part. Okay, great. So um, hopefully everybody knows the definition of a short sale. It's when a um, house will transact to another owner and the lender, so the mortgage on the house, the lender is willing to accept a short. So um, I do think that there is a climate that is um, rising for short sales. It's a little bit different. Um, not sure exactly what to expect because values are climbing at the same, t at the same time. And when it happens, um, it gives people a lot more options. So it's really imperative that a short sale be something that um, leaves a homeowner with few other options because that homeowner, and I think it's going to be kind of common uh, with work and income, is, is that starts to falter, of course. Short sales come around, and um, I think there's a lot of migration, I mean, throughout the entire world, but also throughout the United States, so that could play a role as well. So um, I'd be curious about everyone's objectives or uh, who's already involved with short sales or what is the interest for short sales. If you could just, you know, leave one comment and um, we can go from there because I want to make sure that we hit all of the necessary tools and topics that are of interest and I'll get a better idea about where everybody is with that or whether it's just totally new for you. And I'm hoping um, that, well, I, I would guess that there are some people who aren't really gonna do this, but they need to know what's involved in, in the entire process because they might have other things to be doing and a short sale is a very time consuming thing. So while you're investing or you know do working on your other business areas it would make a lot of sense and also so i'm curious about what people's roles are and we're going to have time for questions later also uh to share um you know something about what your situation is or a particular short sale if there's some kind of um, scenario you envision or that you're looking for some kind of consult on that. So um, we'll get started with, um, and then I'm going to look at some of these comments come in. So I've got some people already working with them. Um, take advantage of a real, real estate broker opportunity. Um, be aware if you aren't licensed and you want to become licensed, it, it's kind of a game changer when it comes to short sales. And the, the next thing I'm going to talk about is basically the objectives that you have here. And to be really clear, especially as investors, it, there's just so much going on and so much opportunity at the same time. So if you're going through a lot of life changes, of course, you know, increasing your revenue and, you know, your own net worth um, it's it's good to to stay very clear about where you are because of just you're going to end up working with different people in, in different settings and 
Um, there might be people that you're already surrounded by that are just not going to be on board with it. So those are the kind of things for every individual to know just how much ambition you have, the drive, what it takes, what it takes to really do this, because you're basically entrepreneurs. And I think when you become a licensed broker, it leaves you with a lot more obligation. It's also important to realize uh, who you represent and basically you're going to be representing yourself and there are a lot of legal issues. So later I'm going to recommend that you have uh, an attorney involved. Um, it's good to envision your plan. And I do think that investors serve a very important purpose in this whole process. It's an unfortunate situation, but at the same time, I, I don't think of there's any other better resolution because so many, um, potential homeowners cannot go through this process. There's too many moving parts. It's so unpredictable and turns, you know, different directions throughout the process and it's really hard to control. And it takes a lot of patience and perseverance. So um, great, I'm, I'm glad that everybody's here. And I just wanna um, start off too with mortgages that, that we all know where mortgages come from. That's basically taxpayer dollars. And one good thing about the United States is that uh, we do believe in uh, liquidity, stability. That objective has been very important from our government and just our values here. So it's not the same way in a lot of different countries. I think that we probably offer a lot more as far as um, lending goes. There are also a lot of people coming from foreign countries that can purchase property here. And it really isn't easy to do that in other nations from, from what I can see and from what clients and people that I know that come from abroad. As far as um, the foreclosures, they're a lot more forgiving than bankruptcy. So there's some things you're going to want to do. And the really important is to vet a short sale because we all know it, it's got to hit a certain range or it just won't make any sense. So it's really important to know what those are. So what I would, would suggest is try to know every aspect of the short sale, you know, just what's involved and also to know that that seller doesn't have too many other options. It's gonna make the negotiation better and a lot more convincing when you get to that point. And so one of the things would be the exact debt amount and how many liens there are. I, the most I've done is five. It was a lot of fun, it took time. And sometimes you can use that as leverage when you're going back and forth with the senior because the senior is kind of the boss. And, you know, eventually when you have enough motivations on the senior, you can become the boss yourself, especially, you know, the negotiator who's working on it. I think you also want to know uh, the value. And if you don't have access to that, I would either hook up with a real estate professional or real estate broker or get really good at using tax records. I think Chicago Deal Vault has an excellent database and I believe it's connected to the MLS. It looked that way to me. But to have other areas too, it's, it's really invaluable. So once you have those, then um, another good question. This could be a non-starter. The question is, was there a cash out refi? Because if there was, I don't know any lender that's going to want to take a short. Because a cash out refi meant that when someone had the mortgage and some time had passed, then they went back to the lender. They might've had a lot of equity in the house and then they decided to refinance the mortgage and they took cash at the same time. And if you do that, it's usually gonna be a pretty sizable amount, you know, 50,000 or, or something more. And it could have, you know, gone into any um, use that they wanted. And it's just more money got blown out of the whole deal. So it's, usually going to be a non-starter, but it's a good question to ask before you even get going because you'd be wasting your time if you, you know, put six weeks into it. Nobody wants their time wasted, really. Another um, option for the, oh, the, the seller, there's going to be some things that they need to produce. And one thing would be a hardship letter and 
you probably should ask for a full release and maybe a letter that's stating paid in full as you get going on this short sale. I just think that's good karma. And you might have a seller that just doesn't have any other wherewithal and it's just, you know, in a hardship situation. You're also going to ask how much cash the seller has, what kind of assets and income, bank statements, credit card spending. They're going to want to see credit card statements and activity for the past three months, probably tax returns, two years, the standard stuff. And they may have their own documents and their own application for the, the short sale itself. But there, there are standard, um, what do you call it? Affidavit of, I think it's, oh, a financial affidavit that you can find online. And it would give you a better idea of what exactly kind of documents these um, property owners are going to need to produce. And you wanna know if there's been any default up to this point. And if there was a default, how many months um, were missing on payments? Because clearly, if these if these defaults, these the Liz pendants gets filed in about 60 days, miss of two payments, and then the bank is starting to look toward auction, it's possible that the bank's got other expenses that they're accruing because of all this. And the auction is around 12 months, it's typical. And there's laws about this. Sometimes they vary from state to state. And so you want to know how close you are to auction, of course. The closer you get to that auction date, and the date is usually set or they have an idea, and you have an idea once you know that it's been 12 months, then it becomes very unlikely that you're going to have success in a short sale. Me personally, if I knew someone was seven or eight months behind, uh, it makes it a little harder. I'd rather have that window a little tighter, like a couple of months of missed payments. I'm not saying that it hasn't been done and I'm not saying that I haven't worked on them. It's just a lot of arguing with a senior lien holder. Let's see, the next thing, uh, what buyers need. Buyers need to be arm's length. That means they do not have any relationship with the homeowner, they didn't know them. And a lot of times if someone finds out that they did know them, it could be pretty problematic. So they're going to need a pre-approval for their mortgage and things start moving quickly once the bank decides to make the deal. So it is good to have that. And also I would highly recommend an inspection and as soon as possible, hopefully a lender would let someone inspect right away. But again, you don't want to have all your time wasted if you're getting inspections on these properties and it's not going to go anywhere. I still the sooner the better especially if the numbers look really great then uh, you are better able to get cost estimates and by a professional or someone licensed and if you're great at inspecting properties yourself you could do the preliminary and you know perfect because I, I did uh, a lot of my investments that way too I had a little bit of background with rehabs I've done 10 myself and I could detect certain things, especially working as a real estate broker I, and working with homes that are historic or very vintage. Then you, you, after a while, you just know what things you want to look for. I look in the basement and I pay a lot of attention to the roof and, and the basement's just pretty much key just because that's where the foundation is and everything else in the house is pretty much resting on that so it becomes important stairways and then systems such as um, plumbing and um, and electric and flooring that kind of thing those are the kind of things that are really expensive and then a kitchen and bathrooms very expensive so if those things are out of order it's going to take some convincing to make me move forward then they will be writing a sales contract and hopefully it's going to be attractive to the lender and they probably should have their own CMA. That is the comparative market analysis on the value of the house. I would recommend that a lawyer be involved 
And if that is the route you're taking with your short sale, I think it's going to be important to get very clear who that lawyer is representing. If they're just doing the transaction, then they really wouldn't be able to give you much advice or consult on anything beyond just the, the details of the transaction. And a lot of times the way that I was doing short sales, I did hundreds of them at a title company and it was really a great way to do it because I could get access to title information right away. And also we had the access to do a preliminary settlement statement right away. And that can be really key. So if you can hook up with somebody that's um, a professional at a title company, that'd be very helpful too. And that's where a lot of lawyers came from. And most of those lawyers represented the home seller, which worked out really well because I've been a broker for so long that that's all I've ever known is, is to represent my clients the best of my ability. So like I said, when you're licensed, it puts a lot more obligation on you as far as following the law, which you should do anyway, but I know the law and some investors, they're, they're just, <laughs> it's possible they could make mistakes without knowing the law. So it, it's good to have a lawyer around, keeps you out of trouble. Uh, also, the lawyer is going to be able to prepare the deed and title and the property search, the title search. So that could save some time in the front end as well. As for loans that you come across in the negotiation process, I'll go into that a little bit more later, but the it's possible when you get a senior lender that wants really tight margins, it's tough. And if you have junior liens on that property, they I'm usually at 10 cents on the dollar. It's not fun to be second in line or third or fourth or anything else like that. So they kind of get punished and everybody takes a big haircut. The other thing is, um, I hate to say it, but a lot of this, uh, you have government entities and granted they're not just government entities. Those are taxpayer funded entities. So I, I think long and hard about this, but sometimes it's the only way to get this whole process closed because you've got a homeowner on the line that just can't continue paying the mortgage. So I, it's probably the best solution at, at the end of the day. So there are certain motivators when negotiating with senior liens. And one of them could be a condition issue. And certainly where we are in our climate, there's definitely weather issues and a lot of other risks, certainly in urban environments as well, because we risk um, the possibility of vagrants uh, coming in or, or vandals and animals and that kind of thing. I mean, it happens certainly in the winter here. These animals are, some of them are looking for places to live that is a lot warmer than what's out there. I think it's nine degrees today. And uh, when you have a really tough junior lean, that is sometimes a motivator for a senior lender because the senior lender might say, hey, you know, I'm not, I'm not caving another 10,000, so you guys can go pound sand. And, or else they'll tell you that they, they've got to have, you know, 300,000 for the sale. And if you've got a junior that's just hanging on saying, I am not taking 10%, I want 50% of my debt. So sometimes it might make the, the bank or the senior lien give a little bit more leeway and suffer with a bigger loss. So uh, condition of the house, hopefully you get really good at assessing the cost versus value for fix ups because you know the numbers, they matter so much. And to know this in advance and to have these skills, I would think maybe it, if you're working alone or you're just starting out to get with a team, and whatever some whatever you want to do, somebody else is already doing it, and it's possible to follow them around. And there's a lot of ways to barter your skills and be able to get um, get some experience that way. There's also a possibility that a lender would ask 
the seller to make a cash contribution to the whole the whole transaction not not something i want to hear but it's possible and there are some sellers that are capable of maybe you know throwing two thousand dollars in or or something like that I, I haven't seen anything much higher than that and it's possible that a lender would provide relocation assistance that means giving um, a little extra cash in the transaction to the home seller but there really there can't be any other transactions going on in the short sale other than what's going to be revealed on the disclosure on the settlement statement otherwise it it gets to be uh, very shady and causes legal problems down the road one exception would be personal property you might have a homeowner who has there, there could have been a death but it, it could be some situation where they have a lot of furniture and a big house and there, it's not anything they're going to be moving or taking somewhere else and moving into a smaller condo and that kind of thing it's possible to make something separate i would let the lawyer know to to make a separate transaction if you're buying any of those items and it's possible too that a seller might want um some moving money or they're they're going to move out of state and can use a little a little extra just just to get down there and so that's when there's times i've seen people purchase some of the um, belongings and possessions inside the house so if a bank really doesn't want to move forward they probably have in mind that they'd like to sell the property themselves some lenders are set up for that and they've got a system and that's that's just their preference so eventually you'll get to know which ones to avoid i like to know up front but while i'm collecting all the information about a seller and about the property and about values i like to know which lender they have and i even look at um i look at mortgage uh the the whole mortgage agreement and just you know what exactly they signed on and to see just certain details and terms but it it's not real interesting and they're quite lengthy so a lot of people i can see why you wouldn't want to read the mortgage agreement and as far as uh an investor you're going to want to have certain things like um documents the authorization to speak to the lender and release information and a hardship letter and the hardship letter would need to indicate that there's no other option that the seller can continue to pay and also the financial information affidavit the bank statements and um, credit card mortgage lien information uh, municipal bills utility bills insurance statement and hoa there's different types of properties and single family homes are probably the easiest and the most appealing and they just work better i think when you get into multi unit buildings that owners are going to be a little bit more sophisticated and probably aren't going to end up in a foreclosure or in a a short sale situation and default very quickly it's it's going to be kind of rare and then the other thing is commercial properties i worked on a handful of commercial short sales and it's really tricky because after they miss one payment the bank can take possession in 30 days and things move very fast if a lender didn't take possession then it's possible to do something however a lot of the commercial lenders that i spoke to they just don't want to play ball so if if you run into one it's possible you might get lucky but there's a lot of reasons that it just isn't conducive. The other thing is once you do um, have success with a short sale on a commercial property, it's unlikely that you're going to have it rented real quickly. And that's, I mean, I love owning commercial property, but that's the, the biggest drawback is that it is not the easiest thing in the world to get tenants. Even I think, um, you know, class a downtown properties we know that's not probably going too well these days and stuff happens things change so i want to know i think we've covered everything i'm going to go through the chat real quick but at the same time if um phil if we are able to um unmute 
and you know take questions that would be great too like i said i just want to make sure that i covered everything or that um you have any specific situations to go over you know i'd be glad to uh try and take a look yes uh, thank you betty um everyone can actually unmute themselves if you have questions Hello, Betsy. I have a question. This is Rob. Hi, Rob. Yeah, I typed it in the chat, but I'll ask it out loud in case the chat's getting hard to read. Getting a lot of comments in there. Uh, is it common for the person who's doing the negotiating to also be able to be the buyer? I know mm -hmm. you mentioned something about an arm's length transaction, but that just meant uh, pre knowledge of the, you know, an existing relationship with the seller beforehand. But if you're the negotiator and the buyer is that uh, typical or do you split that role well um, that would mean that the buyer had enough um, enough income for or certainly the pre-approval and could borrow the amount needed to pay for the house and it's it's going to be harder and I think people get a a different position as a broker I like to kind of double team someone and it makes me a better negotiator I've bought my own property through sellers through the principals it was awful I just hated it talking to the owners so I think it gives you more leverage to either not be the buyer or to have somebody else in the middle because like I said they they really can go to town more easily I think a lender is going to be harder on the if they have the principal in their in in their grasp. I think they're going to be a lot harder on the buyer who is the negotiator at the same time because you you just don't have anyone to blame for anything. And you know, as a broker, it's like we could do that all day long. And have you done any like that, Rob? No, I was just look, exploring that avenue because I've heard people say that you can't do it. They didn't say it, they advise against it. They just said you couldn't do it. So I just wanted to check that information because I, I wasn't sure that couldn't be done that way. And if they're harder, so be it. You know, all we're trying to do is seek out a BPO that's in your wheelhouse. And at that point, that's when the real negotiation starts. Maybe, but they 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 really can beat you up. It's it's amazing. It's absolutely unbelievable. So I, I do think that there are people who do their own short sale negotiation. I just, I could see a lot of reasons why it would make things harder. And also you'd have to explain where you came across the property and that it isn't um, anyone that you knew personally. Yeah, what should I do about it? <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right, hope that answers it. Anybody else has something? Thanks. Um, somebody asked about rising market values and short sales. Um, that is predicted, but I can see the conflict. I can see as property prices rise, it's possible that it the short sale would resolve itself. You would be able to just cut the property loose, put it on the market and sell it. In certain markets, yeah, we know that's happening for sure. Is there a particular percentage that if the listing agent and the short sell seller listed the property for let's just arbitrarily say a hundred thousand dollars is there a certain percentage off of that listing price that a bank is willing to take that we could use as kind of a benchmark to start the process no i i really don't think people think that way i i think it comes down to value so Say say it's a, like you said, you'd like to pay $100,000 for the property. Well, what if the bank thinks the property's worth $300,000 all day long and the debt amount is two seventy five? dollars So there, it doesn't come down to percentages. It, it comes down to what they can find agreeable based on the value. Now, one thing that will affect where that price falls based on value is a condition issue is also a big property tax bill right around the corner i've done that where when it's when it's uh january february in chicago 
I get on the phone to these banks and I just, I just hit them hard. And I said, do you realize the tax bill is due in six weeks? It's $30,000. I said, you want to, you want to pay the tax bill or you want my guy to pay it? So for them, I mean, there's a lot of things. They're just, these, these guys are just less mitigators and some of them are very savvy and some of them are very experienced, but, but a lot of them, they're not paying attention to a lot of things or I'll tell them, you know, guess what? It's uh December uh, 20th. Do you have any idea what kind of weather we're heading for? And the property owner told me they're not going to remain in the property. They said they're going to leave and that's a big mistake, but uh, I hate to see a property go empty. And I, I, I can't say that I can check on it every day and make sure it's in good shape. I might have to winterize it. If, is that what you want or otherwise I, the whole house is at risk of pipes freezing, et cetera, et cetera, and snow not being cleared. There could be lawsuits, that kind of thing. That it, Things just get worse, but I have to remind them about certain things, you know, certainly in our, our climate or in our area. Another question would be, um... If there is a short sale, are we guaranteed that the current people that are residing there will be leaved and vacated and it's a clean property? Well, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you'll do a final walkthrough like any other transaction and realize you're serving a purpose. Uh, they could go to foreclosure if they don't want to do this. I've never seen any short sale seller not cooperate with everything a lot of them they're on board and a lot of times it's their idea they they just want to be able to start over and and sometimes it's from some kind of other hardship like like a divorce or um you know somebody had a health issue i don't know it's i, I just like 90 percent of the people are cooperative and they do want this and they're motivated to do whatever is necessary i mean i, I could tell you a quick story one time i had a um an owner and she called me and she wanted me to take a look. So I did. And then she said, yeah, well, I want to do this. And I could tell, you know, she's a drinker and um, I don't know, maybe use the house as a cash machine. I'm not sure. So then she told me, she goes, I really, really, really want to get to Tennessee and I want to move. And I said, here's the deal. It's like, don't do this. You gotta, you gotta give me some time. I said, it's going to take me 60, 60 days at least. I said, don't move. And she goes, I just, I just don't want to be here any longer. So, you know, went as far as I could. And then she called me and she goes, you know what, I, I can't stay here. And I, I'm going to, I'm packing up and I, I've got a, um, I don't know, I think she had a bus ticket and she was going. And so from that moment on, um, she told me that it would be unsafe to leave the property. And since my sign, because I was brokering the deal, she would, other neighbors would call me and say, hey, you need to know these these guys came in and they put three big dogs in the house and they were warning me not to go in the house. They were just amazing neighbors. Then another person called me and said, you need to know, they just started the house on, in the back area and they started um, a car wash in the alley. I was like, oh my goodness, one more thing after another, I couldn't take it. So I told the bank, it's like, we need to shut this whole thing down. It, it just opens you up to so much more risk. So I don't like when people leave their short sale houses. That's yeah. Did that's someone else have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. As when you're brokering the deal, I've been running across lenders that do not want to pay your negotiation fees or your facilitation fees. Did they pay I've your commission? Also been, I'm sorry. I'm not a realtor. Oh, okay. But my realtor did get the the six percent realtor fees. So is it? common for the broker to have the buyer pay for the brokering services. What do you do in those situations? Thank you. Yeah, I think that is agreeable. And since I did most of these with um, member attorneys at a title company, we took the closing fee. My department took it. But yeah, I, I think that's possible to do that, especially if a, a broker is getting 6% for the deal. Is that something that needs to be disclosed to the lender? Even though I was told by the lender to get the payment from the buyer. Yeah, it is pretty much how it needs to be done because that 
real estate brokers got to, and, and, and a lot of times a bank doesn't care what the broker does with the money. As long as they get what they get. Yep. And the broker is going to have to disclose. Yeah. Everything should be on the, the closing dis disclosure and yeah, just say, you know what? I, I, I need $2,000 for this and then I can get it from the broker, but I would ask for it first and make sure that they think they're getting off the hook with something. I had a broker. Oh my gosh. I must've gotten her maybe a, almost a hundred thousand dollars. And I was, and I wanted the fee for my department in the closing fee and the bank refused to pay it. And so I asked um, a senior managing attorney if I could go to the broker for the money. And uh, they said, nah, I don't do it. And uh, sure enough, I always go greet the broker in the, the closing, uh, the closing rooms. And I just introduced myself and then, you know, the topic came up and she says, oh my gosh, you got to be kidding me. She goes, I would have gladly paid it. <laughs> so ask. <laughs> Betsy, uh, I'm not sure if this is appropriate, but if you, if, if did I lose you? Um, I hear you, Betsy. I think okay. we lost Doug. Okay. Yeah, feel free if you have a question. Hi, Betsy. Hi. Well, we might have lost him. Anybody else have something? Uh, hi, Betsy. Um, hello. Hi, Hi, Bessie. Can you hear me? Yeah. I replied. Hi, Bessie. Bessie, this is Sam. Can you hear me? Hi, Sam. Yes. Uh, is there a lot of short sell coming your way? Uh, I'm a broker also. I'm not getting none. Mm. I... I'm told and by certain forecasts that, yeah, the prediction is that there will be in um, certainly this year and next year. Could last for three years, maybe. But personally, me, I really am not involved with short sales anymore. Just more short sale training. Hi, Betsy. Oh, great. Can you hear me? Yes, hi. Uh, the banks are hi. very weak. weak. I'm, I'm hi. not involved because they mostly dried up from when I was at the title company. So now I'm just in traditional sales. Did someone else have a question? Uh, hi, Betsy. I have a question. My name is Sandra. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have uh, a. Uh, now, have you run into something condo decommission short sale? Yeah. I uh, I just want to you know know um, uh, how how do I make sure that uh, the sale uh, you know goes through successfully? Is there any documents or anything I need to cross check with the seller? Yeah, everything's going to be basically the same. However, since it's a condo, uh -huh. it's going to be association dues, and you right. need to or at least get um, the paid letter, paid assessment letter. And if they're behind on those association dues, a lot of times um, the, the lender, they'll, they might pay, they might not pay, but they need to be told up front that that's one more issue. And anybody, I think it's in Illinois, that they had a law where you're going, any new buyer is on the hook for the six months if if it's six months that wasn't paid, but you can put that under the lender too. So they they the condo conversion they were uh, they were the condo association they are they approved into apartment conversion. 
So you know, I just want to make sure that uh, that deal goes through. So. Yeah, it it shouldn't be too much different other than all that as far as the association yeah. dues because it's got to be handled at closing. At closing, okay, okay, okay. Is there any other extra um, um, cost is going to going to go, going to pay as as a buyer? Any extra sometimes? Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Usually it's three percent for the regular you know regular sale. This one is a deconversion. Yeah, a bank might pay a buyer uh, something, you know, to to get out. <laughs> but uh, I, I I never did that. I, I don't think it's unless they're okay. buying property from them. Okay. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. How are you? Thanks for being here. I appreciate here. it. Thank you know, somebody Betsy, asked about. Oh, go ahead. This is Doug. I. I think my audio cut out. I had asked uh, if someone is in pre foreclosure, like if I'm an investor looking and I see things in pre foreclosure, is it a good assumption that they might have a, a short sale situation that I could approach them directly? Or I know you're a broker and all, but. I think investors should approach them directly. Are you already involved in the business, Doug? No. No, I, I just, I had actually was looking on an on-market deal on an MLS and and um, ended up buying it. Uh, but we were told after we told the broker that we were ready to make an offer that, that it was a short sale. So we went through the process and I, I was just kind of surprised that it was on the MLS. It didn't say short sale. And I see these pre of foreclosures and certainly I'm looking for you know, wedge kind of deals. And I'm thinking that short sales are a good way to get it. And if it's a pre foreclosure, it's most likely that they might be more motivated because they are in a situation and open to any situation. Um, like you, you said something like they would love a short sale versus a foreclosure. Yep. Yep. They would. And it just depends on, where those numbers are. So if that's the situation, that's kind of a game changer and you're going to want to know how much uh, is left on the mortgage. Right. We just came across something and we went and looked at it, but it was a a house that the father had owned and did a reverse mortgage and ran up 300 grand and they were asking a hundred grand for it in a neighborhood where the house was worth maybe 160. So to me, it was a deal, but I'm like, you know, to the bank, yeah, they're going to take a lot less than what it's worth. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, reverse mortgages, uh, some of them are, are kind of dangerous. You, I, I'll tell you a deal that I'm going to be working on, and it's a mansion, and they divide it up into, I think, three units, and there's it's in a great area, so there's a pretty high value. So. I know that the mortgage isn't real high and I know the the homeowner doesn't want to be there a lot longer. And what I want to do is give her a life estate. And that means, you know, I pay off, you know, what debt she has, then I take over the rentals, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, I'll have to let everyone know how that goes, but that is a reverse mortgage. Yeah, and I like it done my way. You know, it's the private it, it, way. It's creative financing, is yeah. It's it's solving her problem and giving her an out. Yeah. Yeah, and then making it really sweet for an investor. So who wouldn't do a deal like that? Okay. So those are out there. You can you know create your own reverse mortgages because somebody made a big mistake. I mean, they had you know truckloads of money, hands full full of cash, and then they went and blew it. And, Ugh, it, yeah, there wasn't enough money in, in that game. Why do you think most short sales are showing up on the market today? Is it that people have lost their jobs or or that they're upside down in the value? Or Yeah, and here's this is a question from Tanya. She said, um, foreclosure process until the homeowner is 120 days late. But that, I believe, is um, something that happened regarding COVID and they did like kind of a, 
mortgage foreclosure moratorium as people were missing payments. They're trying to give them more time, but we can see all of this individual distress that it's affecting so many people and, you know, and trying to keep them away from their jobs and making these, um, you know, mandates and, and such that it's, it's almost like taking away your right to work. So I think, hey, investors out there, you guys want to run your own show? I mean, do it now because things are getting kind of crazy. But yeah, I, I see a lot of distress for that reason alone, if not some others. Hi, Betsy. Can you hear me? Yes, hi. Hi, Betsy. Uh, my name is David, David Myers. I work with a lot of... Uh, off-market properties and homeowners. I worked. This, I got a call from this one gentleman, and I did some research. Pretty much, he is in pre-foreclosure based on Zillow. Uh, but when I got a hold of uh, the attorney, says, I think it's uh, Cordelis, and you, they're you, indicating that Cordelis, Cordelis, thank you, yes. So make a long story short, uh, what's, what has happened is it went to auction and the bank bought it back. There was no other buyers. The bank bought it. And when I talked to Cadillas, they indicated uh, the, la the last step is for the Cook County judge to actually sign off on the foreclosure. So my question to you is, of course, I connected him in with an attorney to try to go in and, and get a stay. But he either, he either wants to do a modification or a... Um, or short sale. So my question to you is, is it too late? Yep. Are you saying you've got a homeowner that wants to do a modification? Yes. Now this that's... this homeowner this a modification or either a short sale, but when we talk to Cadillas, it, it sounds like it's already been foreclosed and but the judge have to sign off on it. So my question to you is is it too late or does that homeowner still have some interest in the home? I know there's a redemption period, but obviously he has to pay for it to obtain the house through the redemption, which he either wants to try to get a modification or either a short sale if he has to sell it. So my question to you is, is it too late? Yeah, I think it's probably too late. The bank has um, been involved with this for way too long and the amount of money it costs yes. under this process is about 80 grand and then the other thing is um if this person hasn't been current on the mortgage what changed did they win the lottery i mean how how could they no he had, no he had, he had an illness that that put him down he had a serious illness uh so but i've heard kind of two two goes to the same thing pretty much it may be too late but i've heard a couple of different scenarios but he's still willing to try to try to work with him go back in the courts but i'm just seeing on my end as a broker it look, look like it's too late to even try to if he were to try to get a short sale like it's not even likely because it sounds like he has no more interest in the property is that that about right it doesn't have much interest if there's any it, and i think once that auction takes place then that is a, a change of ownership new deed so you got yeah bank on there at this point and it'd be like pushing the elephant up the stairs anyway because even if if the transaction didn't take place at the auction which i think it did then why would the bank want to cooperate now i mean it's it's hard to get them absolutely to in the first place. yeah i just thought it was odd i've never heard of a you know a bank where you're taking it to auction the bank brings it to auction but they end up walking away with it because they bought it back that's what kind of just threw me kind of off there. Just so you know, that is probably the most common practice. I was really, doing, yeah, I was doing um, tax sale liens too, and it was my father who taught me that. But anyway, um, when you go to a tax lien sale, you see people there, and there's a lot of activity. But when you go to a foreclosure sale, there might be three or four every single day downtown Chicago. Well, there were. And if you go on that circuit and you go from one auction house to another, like say you hit Codillus, and then there's a lot of people there, but no one bids because the banks are taking the houses back. They take the houses back because they oh. want 
owed. By that point, when they're at auction, they want what is owed. And they're just like, nah, you know, we're, we're not, we're not playing. So they'll say, you know, maybe there's a debt of 225 and then yes. they'll set the auction price at 225 and then no bidders want it because you, why would an investor invest in something that they could just get off the market and go buy something else? MLS. Exactly. Yeah. So, so people don't bid at any of those auctions. However, when you go to a tax lien sale, guess who's there? The banks. The banks are all there. Why, when you buy a house and you have your tax bill, I've seen this happen to clients two times, where they're sending the tax bill to the wrong place and then the owner never got it and never paid the tax bill. So if the owner doesn't pay the tax bill, guess what? It goes to the tax lien sale. When, it's, when it goes to the tax lien sale, the banks are there and I, I like to have my taxes rolled into the mortgage too, because then the bank's going to pay attention and I'll never forget. I'll never miss the tax sale or anything else like that. The tax is going to get paid because the bank pays it, but I, it's already escrowed from what I gave them on the mortgage. So they almost lost their house because the bill wasn't going to the right place. And it's like, it should be right on, on the property tax bill is where to send it. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, you mentioned since you mentioned since you mentioned taxes, have you dealt with the the Cook County Land Bank of dealing with a another property owner where the taxes have been bought by the land bank? Are you familiar with them? Yeah, that means yeah that that means they're the senior now. They trump everything. They trump the mortgage. That's a good way to extinguish a mortgage. Yep, you're right about that. Uh, okay, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, you're welcome. Enjoy the fun. Um, I'm just going to go through this list and let's see if this comes up. Hey, Betsy, uh, one more question. Could okay. you explain to, uh, to everyone the benefit to the seller of working with you as a, I'll call it a short sale negotiator, ahead of time before the auction because they avoid the deficiency judgment? Absolutely. Um, I think it's two months and then there's going to be a Liz pendants filed. Some banks don't get around to it, but it the longer you go, the more someone's credit score credit score suffers. And I do think if somebody already owns property that they'd like to own it again one day and you know there's all kinds of reasons why this happens. It's very unfortunate, but they can start over and, you know, walk away with more of a clean slate. Otherwise you're looking at foreclosure. And I think the sooner it gets resolved, the better it's, it can be really burdensome. And maybe somebody's bought a house that's just too big for them and they're kind of over their head. Hey, man, I think that was Rob. You mentioned uh, deficiency judgment. What, what's that? Yeah, I was coming from the point of view of uh, if it goes to auction, then the bank can come after the prior owner, or we'll call them the seller, for the deficiency judgment. And that's why you want to do a short sale is to avoid that. So if the house is only worth a hundred, but they owe two hundred, that one hundred thousand dollars of difference. Uh, you get that deficiency judgment waived so that the bank doesn't come after them for it. But if they go to the sale, they can come after them. Yeah, do you see that happening? Do you see deficiency judgments actually get? Well, um, I will say that I see many people who give webinars on short sales mention that, that that's one motivating factor to have the seller work with you is to avoid that deficiency judgment and to and to go to battle for them with the bank to make sure that the bank waives the uh, judgment. Yeah, very true. And then, and, and then you get, you know, then they get their 1099C, but that's another battle. Then you make sure you use the uh, mortgage, debt, mortgage Forgiveness Debt Relief Act to try to work that out and go from there. Yeah, there was so a Rob, time. Quick question. That, that deficiency judgment, is that the, 
the back payments that they owe? Uh, I'm not sure, exactly sure how much culminates that total, but it's definitely the difference between what the bank gets for the for the uh, building at the let's just say at the auction and what was owed. That gap, you know, let's just say they owed two hundred thousand and they only sold it for a hundred thousand at the auction. That extra hundred thousand, they can go after the prior owner for it. Yeah, they they can do that even if they did a short sale but it's really uncommon and certainly i would um ask them to do a hundred percent release of any liens okay i've seen them do a hundred percent release but they just 1099 the remaining but they had to pay taxes on it oh right I, well that's not, where that that's what i'm saying that's where, well, that's where you, that uh, Mortgage Forgiveness Debt Relief Act of 2007 comes into play. You got to have an accountant go to bat for you to get that 1099, you know, the 1099C reconciled. Otherwise, they will have to pay taxes. But hindsight, uh, taxes on 100,000 is better than paying 100,000. Even if that was the worst, you know, the worst outcome is they had to pay taxes on it. They're still in a better place. But there's ways to avoid that too. Yeah, I got a, a short sale going on in Matson right now, and the bank did indicate that the owner will have to pay the difference in taxes, whatever the write-off is, along with the attorney that's working on it. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I can see a lot of uh, questions and are interested more about short sales. Um, Betsy, if they're interested to reach out to you, uh, how would they uh, do that? Uh, are you able to share your contacts? Um, you can find me online, and a couple people asked me to send them an email. Um, can we save the chat, and then I will send email addresses to those who requested it? Will that work? Phil, can I save the chat? I believe you can see those uh, on the replay that they are going to send it to later. Okay, yeah, once we are done, so the system will generate the uh, chat, so I can send the file to you. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Well, um, thanks for everyone for attending, and um, hope you do uh, a lot of great work to resolve these homeowners out of these situations, and I do think there are more coming our way, so. Stay in the game, guys. Well, thank, thank you, you as well. Great presentation. Thank you. Okay. In behalf of Chicago Deal Vault and Hugo, I want to say thank you, uh, Betsy. I'm blown away with the amount of information you shared, shared to us today. So uh, it feels fresh hearing directly from someone who has the experience. And I'm pretty sure our attendees got a lot of insights about short sales and might consider uh, venturing in this uh, part of real estate in the future. So you've always been a great resource. I know you have a book, uh, No Fear Investing. Can you also share a little about it? Sure. Um, this book is about base, basic investing, and um, it, it also goes over briefly different types of investing. And I, I just want people to realize, you know, just get in the game and you can do it with almost anything and also almost anything that you have of interest, you know, cars, coins, um, crypto, just, you know, learn something about it. If it's of interest, then it's probably something that would hold your attention and so many things that are increasing in value so quickly. NFTs, uh, there's a lot going on. Um, I love real estate too. So yeah, I mean, everything. It's, it's just such a great, exciting time. And, uh, you know, don't hesitate. It's, it's, it's an easy thing and it can be a lot of fun. All right, perfect. So thank you so much. Hey, Phil, uh, sorry for, Betsy, how, how can we get your book? Oh, it's, it should be released, I think, in February. But, um, yeah, look for me online. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, TikTok eventually. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I would definitely like to do something with the book. And, you know, maybe I could do a book signing over at one of the meetings you guys are hosting, too. So, yeah, there's it, it'll make it real easy to get the book. Thank you. Sure.
Thank you so much, uh, Betsy. Now let me uh, share to you a little about uh, Chicago Deal Vault. So for those who don't have access yet, um, this is how Chicago Deal Vault works. I'm, I'm showing to you the portal. You have access to MLS. This is uh, live, so you will have access to all of the deals coming from MLS. Aside from that, uh, you can uh, get properties coming from off-market. We categorize into uh, probate, pre-foreclosure, upcoming auctions, eviction, wholesale deals and a lot more. You have access to list of private lenders, cash buyers. We do have list of shadow inventory properties that we receive directly from our partner. So you have access from the back door. Um, this is how the deals would show. Uh, if you open to one property, for example, you get all of the data coming from the system. So you have already the estimates provided to you, computed by the system. You have case information. We do skip tracing. So you have the phone number of the owner in case you wanted to reach out. So in instead of sending letters, you can directly uh, call the owners to negotiate on the property. Aside from that, uh, we do have calculators that you can use. Uh, we do search for comps. As you can see, these are the sold properties in the area. So um, if you're interested, uh, feel free to uh, uh, avail the 30-day free trial access. I sent the link in the chat so you could be able to um, avail it. Also, we will do one-on-one -on -one training with you via webinar uh, once you have the access. So apart from that, we would also like to introduce our uh, mentoring programs that Hugo designed. We have cash flow inner circle and wholesale inner circle. So feel free to also check on this. I uh, assigned the or uh, uh, put the link in chat. So for everyone, um, thank you so much for joining today's webinar. It's been another successful webinar with you and uh, thank you as well, Betsy. So it's an honor to have you uh, today. Uh, enjoy the rest of the evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thanks, Phil. You do as well. Thank you, Betsy. Bye-bye.